All right, so last part is section 6.3. Um, we're going to finish up graphing sine and cosine. Um, and we're going to look at multiple transformations. Um, we'll take a look at graphing stuff on the calculator. And then we'll finish with a little bit of solving um, equations, but it's just going to be looking at graphs and using the calculator to solve. Um, no real uh, algebra. Not yet. All right, so whenever we have multiple transformations, there's always a certain order that, that we want to follow. And I gave you that order throughout the week by using the letters A, B, C, D when we wrote the transformations. Um, anyone tell me what the first transformation you would always do in a trig function? Yeah? Uh, horizontal shift. Yep, you always do your horizontal shift. So you start inside the argument. Okay, so you'd start like do something like sine. And the horizontal shift um, would be the first thing. And I think I used the letter A. All right, how about the, um, the next thing you would do? Yep. Period change. You do your period change, or your horizontal stretch or compression. All right, so that would be the letter B in front of the X. Okay, that tells you about the period. Um, now at this point, You've done everything that's inside, now we go outside. Um, what's the, the next thing you would do after the period change? And this would be letter C. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, an amplitude change or a vertical stretch. You can call it either one. And that would be a number multiplied out in front. And the very last thing that we would do would be that would be represented by, um, you just put a D on the end. Now, one thing that I didn't mention that could happen, it has to do with B and C. What, what could happen with B and C? Yeah. They could be negative, and if they were negative, what does that cause to happen? Yep, a reflection. I think we always said B was going to be positive. Um, could be negative, but we just said we're going to deal with positive. But if B or C was negative, that would cause a reflection. You can do the reflection right after the, um, uh, the stretch. Okay, so if you had a horizontal stretch, you could do it like right there. If you had a vertical reflection, you could do it right there. So the reflection always goes right after the stretch, if you have it. It might not always have it. Right. So that's the order we want to make sure we always follow. Okay. Other than that, we'll just we'll look at some problems. So when you're graphing the transformation, you're going to focus on just the transformation one at a time. So what's um, the first number that I'm going to focus on there? And then I'm going to ask what that number does after. Yeah? Pi over 2. I'm going to look at the pi over 2. Okay? The pi over 2 is what kind of transformation? Yeah. A horizontal shift. It's a horizontal shift. So for now, what stays the same? What, what's not going to be affected at all? The y's. If we're going to do something horizontally, the horizontal is going to move the x's around. Right? The y's are not going to change at, at this step. So I need my original y values for um, for sine. Yep. 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0. Yep. So there's my original y's. And now I'm going to take all my x's. And we're doing a phase shift by pi over 2. So what am I going to do to all those x's? Mass? Subtract pi over Right, with the phase shift, we do the opposite. So I'm going to minus pi over 2. And that's going to be my first step. So I get negative pi over 2. 
the next one is 0. Pi over 2, pi, and 3 pi over 2. So basically, I just, I've just done those calculations a lot, so I don't even have to find a common denominator. But if you did, it would be a common denominator of 2 in every problem. So questions on this table? Yeah? Can you look at those y values? So that comes from the original table we looked at on Monday. So there's two original tables that tell you always start with these values, and those values are in that table. And then you do the corresponding x values? For yep, and these ones I wrote out here, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi, those are in the table as well. There's two tables, one for sine, one for cosine. All right, so at this point, we've got this. Sine of x plus pi over 2. Now I need to look at that 2. All right, so I'll, I'll label what this table is. So this is the sine. Um, I'll just write it above it. I need a little space, though. Let's put that over there. And this one is y equals sine x plus pi over 2. Okay, next table is going to be 2 times the, pre the previous table. Now, what's the, um, what's the 2 going to do? What kind, of, um, what kind of transformation is that? It's going to change the y's, and it's going to change them because it's a. <coughs> yeah, it's going to change the amplitude. It's, it's going to be a vertical stretch. So when we stretch vertically, the y's are going to change. The x's stay the same. So now when you copy down your x's, don't go back to the original table from Monday. Go back to the table you just made. Those are your starting points now. Right, so we've got negative pi over 2, um, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. No change in the x's. Uh, but Nate, what's going to happen to all the y values? Uh, multiply by 2. Yeah, they're all going to get doubled. So we're going to have 0, 2, 0, negative 2, 0. Okay. And if I was grading this, as a problem, all I'd be grading is the final table. I'm not grading any other ones you had to use to get there, just the final table. Um, same deal, you'd pretty much get one point for each x and each y. And that's it. That's the table. Any questions on that? Okay, so now we'll, um, we'll graph it and then let's see what we have. So if I look at this, uh, am I skipping over the y-axis here? Look at the x values. Am I skipping over it? Oh, Gabe? Yeah. What value is the y-axis at? Zero. It's at zero, but am I, am I skipping zero in the, um, oh, no. in the x column? No. I'm going to have a point right on the y-axis because I have an x value of zero. And that's every point on the y-axis has an x value of 0. Uh, this one's going to be, in particular, up 2 on the y-axis. So since I didn't skip it, I'm not going to have to skip anywhere. So I've got negative pi over 2, 0, uh, pi over 2, pi, and 3 pi over 2. What are those going by in degrees? What's, what's the gap between each one? Yeah. Um, no, not 45. I said 35. Oh, no, not 35. Chris? 90. 90. That's negative 90, 0, 90, 180, 270. So I, I used marks that are all equally spaced. And that's what, that's what you have to do. So we've got 0. Um, then we're at 0, 2. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go like this. I'm going to label my y-axis by 2s. I don't have enough space. So 0, 2, pi over 2, back to 0. Um, pi, I'm at negative 2. 3 pi over 2, back to 0. Okay, so two things happened. 
One, that graph was shifted um, to the left a little bit, and it was stretched vertically. You don't really notice it's been stretched because I changed the scale. But that's a multiple transformation. Okay. Any questions on that one? Now, if you look at it, we did one transformation that affected the x's. We did one that affected the y's. So technically here, the order is not important. Okay? If you're only doing one transformation that affects an x-axis, and you're only doing one that affects the y, then you really can do them in either order. When it starts to become important is, let's say you do a vertical shift and a vertical stretch that's doing two things on the same axis. Then you really have to follow that order. So here, order would be important because you've got three transformations. So you're definitely going to have two on the same axis. And which one you do first makes a difference. Which axis here is going to get two transformations? The x-axis or the y-axis? Yep. The y-axis. And if you're wondering, well, why does it really make a difference? Well, think of a number in your head, any number you want. Triple it and add one. Now take that same number, but do it in a different order. Add one and then triple it. You're not going to get the same answer. I mean, you might be able to find one number where it does work out the same, but in general, you're not going to get the same answer. All right, so let's make our table. And what, what's the first transformation I have to do? Yep, Ryan? Uh, the period change. I have a period change, and what number am I going to use to do that? Uh, the two. The two. And what values is that going to change? Uh, values of uh, the x values. It's going to change the x's. So that means I can copy the y's down from the original table from Monday. So 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1. All right. Um, you know what, I'll, do, I'll do the same thing I did last time. This is y equals cosine 2x. All right, so my original x's are 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi. What am I going to do to all those x's? There's two ways you can think about it. You can tell me, tell me both. Yeah. You're going to divide them by 2, which is the same as yeah. multiply by 1 half. So 0 always stays a 0. The first coordinate is always 0 unless you do a phase shift and you move the first coordinate off 0. Right? If you don't move it, 0 times anything or divided by anything is always 0. So we get 0. And then what's half of pi over 2? Pi over 4. Half of pi is just half of pi. Um, half of 3 pi over 2? 3 pi over 4, and half of 2 pi is 1 pi. And there is a pattern there. It's 0 pi over 4, 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4. So there is a nice, they're all nicely spaced. And they're all 45 degrees apart. And they're going to stay 45 degrees apart, because you're done with the x's. Those aren't going to change. All right, now we need our, our next table. What number am I going to focus on next? Yeah? The, um, three yeah, the 3. Right? I would probably, if I was doing it, I would do the 3 and the 1 at the same time. But since it's our first time doing a 3 transformation, we'll, we'll do each one separate. So 3 cosine 2x. Um, Kathleen, the 3 is a what kind of transformation? Uh, a vertical stretch. It's a vertical stretch. Vertical means the y's are going to change. X's stay the same. 0, 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4. But I reduced. All right. Um, and how about? Kaylee, 
how am I going to get the new y values using that 3? You just multiply the old y values by the 3. By the 3. So we're going to get 3, 0, negative 3, 0, 3. 3, 0, negative 3, 0, 3. Okay, so now that, that table's done. Now we've got to make one more table, and that's going to deal with the plus 1 at the end. So y equals 3 cosine 2x plus 1. So Tori, what's the, uh, what's the plus 1 going to do? Yeah, it's going to take what we have and shift everything up 1. So x's stay the same. Um, again, 0, 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4. Again, I reduce them all. And now add 1 to all the y's. So 4, 1, uh, negative 2, 1, 4. And that table on the right, that's the final table. So that's, that's what you get one point for each x and y value. And now the, the sketch itself is usually worth like a point or two, however it works out. All right, um, let's see. On the um, y-axis, what could I go by? Yeah. Yeah, I would probably go by twos, because I don't, if I go by ones, I really don't have enough space, but if I just add in one more line right there, I think I can go by twos. So zero, two, four, negative two. And then on the x-axis, well, that's zero, 45, 90, 135, 180. They're all spaced by 45, and you're not skipping the axis, so you don't have to do any skipping. So 0, 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4. If you didn't reduce it and you left it as 4 pi over 4, that's not really a huge deal, but we usually reduce. All right, let's make it a little smaller. Uh, so we got 0, 4. Pi over 4, we're at 1, so that would be about right there. Uh, pi over 2, we're at negative 2. 3 pi over 4, you're back to 1, and then back to 4. Okay, so remember, even though it looks like a V-shape, it, it's part of a wave. So do your best to just make it look kind of curved. Any questions on, on that one? So that has three out of four transformations in it. Uh, this one's. Uh, does anyone feel like they need to see another one? This one would have a phase shift and a vertical shift. Any questions on how you do that? Would the order matter here? It wouldn't, because you're doing one on the x, you're doing one on the y. So it's not like you're doing two things on the same axis where order could matter. So technically here, you could do either one first. But if you stick to the order I gave you in the beginning, you'll always be OK, even if you're not sure if you should. But I probably would just follow that order. All right. So this one's a little different. We're not going to sketch it by hand. It's just find a complete graph of 4 sine 3x, and then find the domain, range, amplitude, period. Now, when I graph it, we're going to do it a couple ways. We're going to, I want to set it up so that I see two cycles. Okay, so we'll, we'll try to figure that out first, or two periods. And then we'll set it up so we can see three periods. So the way I'm going to do my answer is I'll put the graph, and then next to it I'll write the x min, the x max, y min, and y max that I needed to see exactly two periods. All right, so first thing we'll, uh, we'll type it in. Now, 
we're dealing with a trig function. So anytime you deal with a trig function, what is it important to decide? Something on the calculator. Yeah? It's um, radians or degrees. Yeah, if it's radians or degrees. And you can do either one. We've been doing radians all week, so we can stick with radians. That's just going to influence what we use for like x min and x max. Would we use something like 2 pi or should we use 360? Well, if you're in radians or degrees, that would tell you which one to use. All right, so we're in radians. Uh, um, how about the, higher, the highest and the lowest? Okay, if we can figure out the amplitude, that's going to give me a hint about that. What's, what's the amplitude here? Yeah? Four. Four. So what I'll do is, um, let's move this down a little. We'll start writing these things down. So the amplitude is four. Um, what about the period? What's the period going to be? Yeah. Um, three is going to be part of it. It's going to be the denominator of the period. But there's something, something else we need. But three is part of it. And remember the formula from yesterday? I had like the t equals. Is it two pi over three? Yep, it's two pi over three. So what that tells us is, if you can set a window on the screen that's that wide, you will see one cycle. And there's lots of ways you could do that. You could go from 0 to 2 pi over 3. You could go from 2 pi over 3 to 4 pi over 3. You could go from, you know, there's all, all different ways to set a window that's 2 pi over 3 wide. So we got that. Um, and the domain. So we already kind of know what these functions look like. Right? They look like a wave. So what do you think the domain would be if you were to graph this? Yeah? Yeah, it goes on forever. Every sine and cosine function has the same domain. They're all negative infinity to infinity, all of them. When you get into tangent and the other ones, that's not true. That's negative infinity to infinity. And now the range. Um, so what would the range normally be if you didn't do anything to it? Like what's the highest and the lowest it would normally go? Yep. It, would be negative one to one. it would normally be negative 1 to 1, but we've done a vertical stretch by a factor of 4. So it's no longer negative 1 to 1. It's, yep. it's going to be negative 4 to 4. And it does reach those. So now I've got an idea of uh, how high and low I need to set my window. I'm going to go negative 5 to 5 on the y-axis. Just give myself a little extra. Okay, so let's go negative 5 to 5. Now, I want to set it up so that I see two cycles. Um, how wide did we say one cycle was? Or one period? Wait. It's 2 pi over 3. So if I want to see two cycles, how long would two cycles be? It would be 4 pi over 3. So you have to set your window so that your difference between your x min and your x max is the number you just set. So one easy way to do it is set this at 0, set this at 4 pi over 3. 4 pi over 3. So now you should see exactly two cycles. Um, and let's graph it and see. There's finishing up the first one. And there's the second one. And that's exactly two cycles. So I'll just put that down there. And the window I used. Again, there might be other windows you could use for the y's, but you couldn't use anything else. Well, actually, yeah, you could do other things for the x's too. Let's put that over there. 
What else could you use besides 0 to 4 pi over 3? What's another way? I mean, there's really an infinite amount of ways. It's like if I said I want you to have a window five units wide. It could go 0 to 5. It could go 1 to 6. It could go 11 to 16. Anything that's five units wide. Yep? Like negative 2 pi over 3 to 2 pi over 3. Yeah, negative 2 pi over 3 to positive 2 pi over 3. If you take your max minus your minimum, you will get <coughs> 4 point something, which is, is what our window was, four point, uh, about 4.19. Right, let's look at that one. So it looks, um, it looks kind of the same, but you can see the difference now as you've centered the axis on the screen. So you're still seeing this cycle, right, this first one right here. But now you're also seeing the one before it that's off the screen there. So that's also an acceptable answer for two cycles. All right? How about if I wanted to see three cycles? What's a simple way I could set my, my x min and x max to see three cycles of the graph? Yep. Yeah. Or we can just leave the x min and then for x max just do three pi What would you put here? Yeah, we could leave the x min at um, negative 2 pi over 3, and we could set the x max to 4 pi over 3. There you go. It's exactly three cycles or three periods of the graph. In general, how many periods um, should you sh uh, show? I would say two is probably good, unless they tell you um, otherwise. Um, that was a negative. Okay, so three is. Three is fine, but two is sufficient unless they say otherwise. And when we're sketching by hand, we only just do one by hand. Yep. For the x min, could you have put zero and then for the x max, put six pi over three? Yep. If you did zero to six pi over three, you would have seen this one, this one, and then the next one after it. Okay. Yep. You would have just put your axis right on the edge of the screen. Yep. But that would have been fine too. So any questions on that? Okay, what you don't want to do is accidentally cut off like the, the peaks or the low points of the wave. You gotta make sure those are all on the screen. And preferably not right on the very edge. You know, a little bit of space like that is, is good. All right, let's look at this one. So it says find a complete graph, and then same thing. Domain range period and amplitude. This time, we'll just set it up for um, two cycles. So complete graph, I'd like to see two, two cycles of the graph. Right. Um, Jacob, what's my amplitude here? Um, three. Yep. Absolute value of the number in front would be three. Now, don't write this down, but what if I did that to it? What would be the amplitude now? Yep, three. it would still be three. That negative would definitely change the picture, it would cause a reflection, but it wouldn't change the amplitude. Um, how about my period? What's the period of this graph? Robin? Yeah, it's just two pi over the number in front of x. So what did you say, what's the number in front of x? Um, the only, if I had this, this would be what you just said. That would be 2 pi over negative 1. So 2 pi over 1. It's just 2 pi over 1. There is no change to the period. There is no period change in that problem. All right, so amplitude, period. Um, how about the domain? Yep. Negative infinity to infinity. Every sine and cosine function. I already said it. It's always negative infinity to infinity. If it goes left and right forever, and you stretch it a little, or shift it left and right, it's still going to go left and right forever. Um, and how about the range? Think about what it would normally be, and then think, have you done anything vertically? If you have, check for a stretch first, then check for a shift.
Hello, uh, Gabe, you think you know what the, um, what the range is? Yeah, it would normally be negative one to one, but you've stretched it, so it's now negative three to three. Now, if you had a vertical shift, you would then apply that. Like let's, again, just watch this part. Let's say there was a plus two on the end. Well, I would say, all right, it's stretched by factor of three, so it's negative three to three, but then both of those numbers are moved up two. So then it would be like negative one to five. All right, so then if there was a shift, you would do that at the end. But this one didn't have it. All right, um, so let's set up our, our window. Uh, let's start with the y's. What would be, um, Natalie, what would be good values for the y's? Um, <coughs> one and negative one. I mean, negative four and four. Yeah, you could do negative four and four, even negative five and five. That's not. That's not awful. You wouldn't want to do like negative 50 and positive 50. That, that's going to squish your graphs, graph so much you're not even going to see it. Um, but if we want to zoom in a little, we can, we can zoom in. All right. And now I want to see a graph of two cycles. So look at the length of one cycle and double it. That has to be the difference between your min and max for the x's. So what could I put for an x min and an x max? Yeah. Um, you do 0 and then 4 pi. Yeah, 0 to 4 pi. You could do negative pi to 3 pi. You could do 10 pi to 14 pi. Um, you don't really want to make it too complicated, but just make it 4 pi units wide. Um, and I think once I type it in, we're good. So 3 sine x minus 1. Right, so I can see that it goes um, as high as 1, as low as negative 1. And it's been shifted 1 radian to the, um, to the right. So it hasn't been shifted a lot. It's been shifted a little bit. But we do have two, two full cycles. Because if you copy and paste that picture right next to it, you'd get another, another two cycles in the graph. Okay, so let's put down the, um, the window we used. Oh, let's off. Okay, any question on that one? All right. So let's take a look. Um, we looked at this, I think, the very first day. The graph of sine and the graph of so cosine at the same time. So here's sine. I'm going to do cosine in red. And look at the difference between them. There's sine. There's cosine. If you had to describe the difference between them as a transformation, which out of the four that we studied, which one is, is the most accurate way to describe what happened between the blue and the red wave? Yeah? Horizontal it's a horizontal shift. Exactly. So all you have to do is shift the blue one left or the red one right, you could look at it either way, and they would be exactly the same graph. So in this case, um, if I set my tick marks so the scale goes by pi over 2, you should be able to see exactly how much you need to shift it by. So if you look at like the distance between each tick mark as a section, how many sections apart are the red wave and the blue wave? One. Yeah, if you can't see it, make it a little bigger. But they are they're one section apart. Look at like the peak on the red and the next peak on the blue. They're exactly one section apart. And how wide did I just make each section on the um, graphing calculator? I made them 90 degrees, or I made it in radians, pi over 2. So that leads us to the horizontal shift identity. If you take the graph of sine and you shift it to the left, pi over 2 radians, that's the graph of cosine. Or what else could you do? Instead of shifting sine 
to the left pi over two, you could shift cosine, yeah? To the right two. To the right, how much? Two. Um, not two, because they're not two radians apart. How far apart are they? One. Well, one section on the screen, but each section is how big? Two. Pi over two. So you could shift sine left pi over two, or you could shift cosine right pi over two, and you get the same graph. So what this gives us is a way to turn sines into cosines, or cosines into sines. All you have to do is modify the argument by 90 degrees, and you can change one trig function into another. So if you think about it in degrees, if I had something like the sine of, let's say, I don't know, 40 degrees. Actually, let's do something like, let's do 140. You could think of that like this. The sine of x plus um, 90. So in that case, what, what would x be? What plus 90 is 140? 50. 50. So what I've tried to do is just kind of set up the same pattern you see right here. The sine of 50 plus 90, except I just I don't have any variables. I just use a specific number. So the sine of 140 would be the same as the cosine of what number? Cosine of 50. This is right there. So the sine of 140 is exactly the same as the cosine of um, 50. And we could prove that. You just do it. Um, you take the sine of 140, and you take the cosine of 50. Um, oh, but you got to do it again. What's wrong? Why am I, why did I get different answers? I'm in radians, I did that, I did that in degrees. So that, that makes a big difference. You can do it in radians, we just didn't. Now let me type it in again. So sine of 140, there we go. Cosine of 50, there we go. They get exactly the same thing. Okay. Any question on that, that idea? So it just gives you a way you could change a sine problem into a cosine problem if, if you had to for some reason. All right, so the last thing we're going to look at, um, and we're going to look at this a couple times. Today we're going to look at it graphically. Uh, next time we look at it, we're probably going to do it algebraically. But we're going to solve a trig equation on the calculator. When you want to solve a graphing problem on a calculator, we usually type one equation in y1, we type the other one in y2, and then what do we look for? Yeah? We look for an intersection. So if I did something like this, um, I need to change my window because my window is still set in radians. If I go back to it, you're going to see all the decimals like with pi. Well, I can show you in degrees, but I have to go to zoom 7, and it will reset everything for degrees now. So if you see a trig function that looks kind of straight, it's because your window isn't right. Now, if I wanted to describe the solutions, um, how many solutions do you see? where these waves cross, or where those two graphs cross. Yeah? Yeah, in that particular window, there's five. But if I zoom out, you'll see even more. It's just going to keep crossing forever. So eventually, we want to come up with a way that you can say, here's the solution. And this represents every solution you could ever have. Right? So there, there is a way to do that. Because the solutions occur very regularly, so we can we can write it. But for now, all I'm going to say is find all the solutions in a given window. 
So yes, I know there are more solutions outside that window. For now, I'm not interested in them. Okay. So that's going to be like your X-min and your X-max. Okay. So just like we've always done. Actually, it's almost the same problem I just did. You're going to put sine of x in, in one of your equations. You're going to put the number in the other one. And make sure you set your window. Now, I'm going to change back to radians. Um, but if I was doing this in degrees, what would my x max be? And it's telling you right there, but that's radians. It would be 360. And what would my x min be? Zero. So if you wanted to do it in degrees, that right there is telling you zero to 360. But since they gave it to me in radians, they probably want the answer in radians. All right. And so now let's set it from zero to two pi. Um, rather than having each tick mark worth 90 units, because you wouldn't even see one tick mark on the screen, because we're only going zero to 6.3. Let's make each tick mark worth <coughs> 90, but in radians. So like each tick mark is about 1.57. Um, probably don't even need to go as high as negative 4 and 4, but it'll work. So we'll just leave it. So what you're looking at is exactly one cycle. So another way this problem could have been worded is it could have said, find all solutions in the first positive cycle. That's what you're looking at right there. The first positive cycle. It's to the right of the y-axis. All right, now how do I find an intersect? What do, I, what do I press to do that? Yep. Second calc. Second calc, all right. And then five. And then five. Remember, pick a point on the blue, pick a point on the red, and put your guess closer to one of them. Okay, I did the second one. If, if someone else can do the, um, the first one, that would be helpful. So one of the answers is 2.73. And there's one more. Um, what's the um, second intersection? Point four one two. All right, so zero point four one, and I'll just round it to two decimal places. Okay. Any questions on those two? Now there was a button on the calculator that some people were um, talking about last week when we had to flip trig functions, and it was this inverse sign. Well, that doesn't flip a trig function, but what it does do is it would solve that problem a lot faster than you can even type it in, graph it, and do second calc intersect. So I got this 0.411 number that everyone else got graphing. Now the question is, how did I get this 2.73? Right? It was an answer on the screen, but the calculator doesn't tell me there's two answers. Well, there's a way to figure out um, the second answer. Um, we're not going to get into it too much today. But I'll show you what it is. It's pi minus the last answer I had on the screen. There's your 2.73 answer. So once, once you know how to find one of these answers by hand, the second one is very easy to find. It just depends on a quadrant you're in. And there's a way to, it's like a little shortcut for figuring out a formula to do it. So eventually, we'll do this the way I just showed you on the calculator. But for now, we'll stick with the graph. Even though I think graphing is a lot slower. All right. Any questions on that one? All right, let's try this one. Um, 2 cosine half x equals 1.5. And let me just fix the interval. OK, 
Okay, so we're looking between 0 and 2 pi. Now, if I wanted to be a little picky, um, usually when you set up an interval, you don't include the left edge and the right edge. You include one or the other. Because 0, and if this was degrees, would be 360. 0 and 360 are repeats. So if you include 0, you don't need to include 360. Right? So, but they're including both here, so that's, that's OK. So I'll set up the same kind of thing. 2 cosine, 1 half x, 1.5. My window's already set from last time, um, negative uh, 0 to 2 pi. Uh, negative 4 to 4 is going to be OK, because this is going to be negative 2 to 2. So it's going to fit. It's going to fit fine. So if you look at this one, you only have one answer this time. And that's because you've stretched out the period so it couldn't repeat fast enough to get to come back up and hit the line again. Okay, it's been stretched out off the screen. So the only answer you get this time is 1.45. About 1.45. questions on that one. And if you were to do this one without a graph, it, it, it would be a little more work than the last one because there's some more, there's a number in front and a number inside with the x. But if you took the inverse cosine of 0.75 and then doubled it, you should get exactly what we just got, 1.45. So maybe you can figure out why I did that, inverse cosine of 0.75 and then doubled it basically kind of solving that equation for x. Um, if you're not sure what I did, that's OK. Don't worry about it right now. I'm just showing you there is a faster way to do it. Okay, but graphing's good for now. Um, okay, let's try this one. So this time, they've set a window that technically is a proper window if you're looking at one cycle. It includes 0. It doesn't include 2 pi. So if there was an answer right on the right edge of the screen, we would not include it. And this time, it's a trig function equals a trig function. Um, that's a little harder to solve with algebra. Unless you can get rid of one of those <coughs> trig functions, um, you're going to have a little bit of a problem. Now, we have a horizontal shift identity. So we can change sine into cosine. But then when you do that, you make the argument more complicated. Right? You change it into something that was just a single thing to then two things. So then now you've got a difference of two things or a sum of two things, and that gets even more complicated. So we're going to hold off on the algebra part for that for now. So let's just graph it and uh, see what we got. 3 cosine uh, 1 half x and 2 sine x. First thing, I just want to make sure everything's going to fit. Um, 0 to 2 pi, I already have that. The highest trig function is going to be on the left. It's going to be negative 3 to 3, and I can fit that on the screen. So my window's fine. So there's the left, and there's the right. How many times do they cross? Wait. Yeah, they, they are going to cross three times. And you would find the intersection point here, here, and here. Any questions? I'm not going to go through them if there's no question, but any question on how you would do it? Just more annoying because you've got to do it three times. All right, and last one. Um, what's a little different here? Wait. It's a greater than. So this time, your answer isn't going to be like x equals and then a number. What kind of answer are you going to have this time? Yeah? It'll be a range. Yes, it's going to be an interval. Your answer is going to be between this and this. Right. 
So let's graph it, just like you would if it was an equation. So 2 cosine x and negative 1.3. And the window is 0 to 2 pi, um, highest and lowest, negative 2 to 2. So the range is already all set. So we've got a graph. I've got negative 1.3. And do I want to know where the cosine graph is above negative 1.3 or below? What am I looking for? Above. Where it's what? Above. Yeah, we're looking for where the, the trig function is greater. So where is it above? All right. How many section or sections is the blue graph above the red line? Two. two. I would say there are two from here to here, that's one, and from here to here. So I want to describe those two things in green as intervals. Well, what's the left edge, like right here? What's the x value of that point? Zero. Can we include zero? Yes, we can x can be greater than or equal to 0. So that interval is going to start at 0, including it, up to, um, what do I have to find? Yep. Yep. I have to find this intersection point right here. So let's find it. And then my next question is going to be, can we include it? So first curve, second curve, just put the guess a little closer. It's about 2.28. Now. Can I include 2.28? Some people say yes, some people say no. Emily, you said no, how come? Right. It says that the trig function has to be specifically greater than, not greater than or equal to. So you can go up to 2.28, but you cannot include it. That describes the first interval in green. Or, um, how would I figure out where my next interval in green starts? <coughs> Joe? How would I figure out where my next interval in green starts? Uh, you do uh, intersect mm -hmm. lines. And am I going to be able to include that point or not include it? Uh, no. No, I cannot include it because, again, it said the trig function has to be greater. So we get from 4.00 up to, what's the edge of that interval? Yep. It's 2 pi. Can I include or not include 2 pi? What do you think? You cannot. If you include 2 pi, that's a repeat of 0. So you really don't want to do that. So being very technical about it, this would be your answer. And you could put 2 pi there, but since we did decimals on everything else, that's what I did. So the only one that had a bracket on it was the 0. Now, you could have had other brackets if that was an equal to. Okay? If that was an equal to, that would change this to a bracket, and it would change this to a bracket, but it wouldn't change that last parenthesis. That, that would not change. Okay. So any questions on that? All right, so that pretty much finishes up everything we're going to look at with um, sine and cosine. So tomorrow we're going to look at the other four trig functions. We're not going to go into as much depth as we did with sine and cosine, because we're going to do all four in the same day. And we're going to do every transformation. Um, but since you've already seen the transformations with sine and cosine, there's no difference with tangent or any of the others. So some of the problems are um, graphing. Some of them are um, solving. So you do need a graphing calculator. Is that 340 or 346? Uh, 346. I think. No, it's 346. Um, so it's 2 through 4, 7 through 10, 15, 17, and it kind of skips around 21 to 23, 29 to 32, and 36, 39, 43.
So we'll look at that tomorrow. That'll be the last homework assignment for the week because tomorrow night's homework is going to be half of the take-home test. And we'll finish the take-home test on Friday in class.